Today's message time will be presented as audio only due to technical challenges. This message will be re-recorded and the service will be reposted tomorrow, April 29th. We apologize for the inconvenience. Good morning and welcome to the Olive Branch. We are so glad that you are joining us for our final week of Good News Give Back. We hope over the past couple of weeks, you've been encouraged and inspired as we've celebrated what God has been and is doing in and through our church. Just like the original disciples, we are to duplicate Jesus. We are to be his hands and feet in this world. He wants us to join him in his movement of generosity, to love, to serve, and to give to others generously. Today, let's get excited as we talk about and challenge one another what it means to be generous with our treasures, our financial resources. But first, let's send our hearts and sing together.
captives then you're freeing hearts right now you are the same god you are the same god you touch the leper then i feel your touch right now you are the same god you are the same weeks ago, we started into this series called The Good News Give Back, and the goal is not just to talk about this stuff. The goal is actually to do something about it. Uh, Jeremiah talked to us first about loving, so the goal is to learn how to love, to grow in that part of our lives. Kelly talked about serving, and the goal is to grow in that part of our lives, and today I want to talk about giving. Now, before I do, I just want to mention just some facts. These are some facts. This is not stuff that I made up uh, for this purpose, but we know this, I think. We have more than anyone else ever has in the history of humankind. We really do. More people have more than they ever have. That's the truth about us, especially in the West. In Canada, we live in, you know, one of the best nations ever. You know, we live in one of the wealthiest parts of that nation, the GTA. 19% of Canadians give anything, only 19%. That means that 81% give pretty much nothing. Proportionately, the more people have, the less they give. This is interesting because study after study has shown this. The more people have, the less they give, okay? And the other fact on this, and this is just something I've noticed over the years, wealthy people tend to play games with their money, and we would have to be considered wealthy. And so we do this thing, you know, where we want to use, you know, we, we think we know better, and we think because we have money that we're smarter than other people and so on. And then sometimes when people have a lot of money, they will kind of, you know, put like a thing on it, like, the, like a marionette, and they'll make the dollar dance, you know, like they come in and they give it, but then they're, they're manipulating it around. Well, if you do what I want, you know, uh, then you can use the money, and if you don't, then I'm going to take it back. So th that's just, you know, the point I think that Jesus would make is either give it or don't give it, one of the two, okay? So let's start back with our hearts, okay? That's kind of where I want to go today. Uh, years ago when I was working on a Saturday morning once in another church that I was serving, uh, there was a knock at the one side door, so I went to see who it was. I was the only one in the building. And outside the door there, were, uh, there was a mom with two daughters, and they said that they had come for our free store. Well, I said, well, that, that's not till next week, so come back next week, you know. And she told me that they wanted, you know, they'd come by bus and they wanted to get blankets and so on. I said, well, if you come back next week, I'm sure we can help you. Got back to my office and I thought to myself, that's not right, you know? Something's not right about this. I think I could help them. So by the time I got back to the door, they were gone. I felt really bad, you know? And I still feel ashamed at that moment. I should have done something. I should have used my head a little bit more quickly in that time. The thing that we struggle with, and this is, this is research backs us up too, when people don't do the small things that they could do to show kindness, there's a sense of regret down inside. And the bigger things cause even more regret. I don't know if you watch anything, you know, the footage on 9-11 and people who got out of the buildings or people who get out of plane crashes or whatever. And so they describe how, you know, this thing happened and man, they ran for their lives and they got out and they escaped with their lives. But almost all of them will say something like, you know, I think about the screams I heard as people were dying and I didn't do anything. And usually their chins will start to quiver and they'll say, you know, I try not to think about that. And there's a reason for that. We were made in the image of a God who is compassionate and who is generous and who is kind and who gives. And there's something inside of us that knows that it's not right to just stand by and watch bad things happen and not do anything about it. But the truth of the matter is that selfishness has a, has a place in our lives. And I'll tell you, it can be ugly, especially when it brings all of its little ugly sisters along with it, you know, self and selfishness and self-interest and self-preoccupation and narcissism. And then it gets into greed, 
which is if it comes to me, <laughs> it belongs to me, and ain't nobody else going to get it. Now, in terms of seasons, and you've heard both Jeremiah and Kelly talk about seasons, in terms of seasons, we start out pretty much with our heart frozen. Like there isn't anything moving. Our, it takes a lot to get our hearts moving. And what God does is he allows us to be in circumstances where it's almost like his hands are on our heart and he's thawing our heart so that things start to move. And then we move into spring and, you know, it's a wet time, you know, and tears flow and, and we think, you know, I, I, I need to do something. And if we don't do something, that's, that's kind of the defining moment. If we don't do something, when God is moving our hearts, when God is warming up our hearts, then we usually go back to our frozen state. In farm terms, uh, it'd be a little bit like a farmer saying, you know, so he's got this wheat that he's harvested, and these are actual grains of wheat, probably not the kind that you would actually, you know, that you actually plant. But, you know, it's kind of like he looks, he would look at his wheat and say, you know what, like, we don't have a lot of bread around our house. I think I'm going to grind up the seed and just make flour with it. We'll eat it, and then, you know, we'll do something next year. Well, you know what happens if you keep doing that, right? You end up with nothing. It's a dumb farmer who doesn't save something aside to plant for another season. And that's kind of where we find ourselves sometimes as human beings, where we think, I, gotta, I, I, don't, have any, I don't have any excess grain around my house. I don't have excess, any excess money. I'm just going to keep it for me. And, of course, that's a mistake. Now, let's start with the core story. And, again, Jeremiah and Kelly have been telling us some of the details of this. But this story probably depicts you know, desperation more than any I've ever seen, and then a group of people, unlikely people, who can do something about it. What's driving the desperation here is that a group of people in the city of Samaria, and okay, so this is northern Israel, so that's why it's not Jerusalem, and they've been attacked by the uh, Aramaeans, which would be the Syrians, uh, basically came out of Damascus and came down. And so there's been this, you know, tit-for-tat kind of thing going on between the Aramaeans and the, uh, and the people in Samaria. And so what they did was this Sumerian army came down and used a tactic that was very popular back then. They would put on a siege, which was basically they would surround the city and, you know, and they, people obviously are not going to let them in, but that meant that nothing else could get in either, including the food. And they just basically starved them out. Things got so desperate, the prophet Elijah tells us, things got so desperate there that women were eating their children. It's horrible, horrible. It has to be one of the most desperate stories in the Bible. And then they're selling dove poop, okay? Their people are eating dove poop, which is gross. Donkey's head. A donkey head was selling for about the same price as a house. So this was a horrible, horrible scenario. In the middle of this come four lepers, and these lepers are basically desperate themselves because not only that, you know, to be a leper is basically you get shoved out of everything, shoved out of your family, shoved out of your community, and you're just basically outside the walls starving to death, which is what they were. So listen to what happens. Now, there were four men with leprosy sitting at the entrance of the city gates. Why should we sit here waiting to die, they asked each other. We will starve if we stay here. But with the famine in the city, we'll starve if we go back there. So we might as well go out and surrender to the Aramean army. And if they let us live, so much the better. But if they kill us, we would have died anyway. So they go out to the camp. And when they get there, it's probably just a couple of kilometers, I'm guessing, from the city. Uh, it's creepy, quiet. The only sound is like the tent flaps, you know, going, you know, smacking in the breeze and so on. And so what they realize is that the whole place has been deserted. Now, you read earlier what God had done was he had basically sent the sound of, you know, armies marching and chariots going and all this stuff and scared them. And so they ran off back to Damascus. So they get in there and they're like, wow, this is great. So they're drinking the wine and eating the food and, you know, taking the gold and the silver and the clothes out of the tents and going and, and making sure that they, you know, could grab them for themselves, grab, run, and hide, which is kind of what we do with our money. But then there comes this defining moment, which changes everything. Finally, they said to each other, this is not right. This is a day of good news, and we aren't sharing it with anyone. If we wait until morning, some calamity will certainly fall upon us. Come on, let's go back and tell the people of the palace. And that decision turned four ordinary lepers, and that's what we don't have their names. That's what they were known by. Lepers were turned into heroes that day. And they changed the trajectory for the city. They changed the trajectory for all the people that lived there, possibly their own families and own, own relatives. Now, 
So this is kind of where we want to get, okay? A um, guy by the name of Jim Elliott said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep. Those lepers couldn't keep that. I mean, they were dying people. They couldn't even use it all. Who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Let me give the context for that. Jim Elliott uh, was part of a group of five missionaries that went down to the Wolrani tribe down in, down in Ecuador. And this stuff is actually from that tribe. They actually made um, this blowgun and this and the stuff that's here. And uh, they went down to reach them and they went through this long process of finally landing a plane on the beach and then reaching the people. And in, that, in those first few days, they got speared to death and they died. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep. In this case, it was his life to gain what he cannot lose. And that's profound. That's profound truth. You think about these guys, these four lepers who went back, you know, to basically, you know, uh, loot this whole camp and then decided that they needed to turn around and go back. What they found, I mean, what are you going to do if you're a leper and you're dying? You know, you've, you've already got the expiry date on your foot alongside the, bur, uh, the barcode and you know you're dying and... You get all this stuff. What are you going to do with it? You can't even pass it on to your kids because, because you don't have any contact with them. So God made it available to them, and then they pass it on. Now, here's the difference. Greed is basically saying, if it comes to me, it belongs to me, and I can do whatever I want with it. So this is kind of a, a picture, if you don't mind, of just the way this works. The visual for this, for good news, is... They're in the Aramean camp, okay, and they find all this pile of stuff. In Samaria, everybody's starving to death. Horrible situation there. So they're basically saying, this is a day of good news. What are we going to do with it? Because if we just keep all this stuff for ourselves, we're going to be in trouble. So that was the good news back then. And the good news now for us is being able to give to other people and help them with what God has given us. And compared to the world, we have way more. And the question that you and I have to ask ourselves is, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do if he had what we had? I don't think he'd probably be making any, any you know, excuses about it. Jesus uh, actually told a story about greed. And it, he basically said, you're familiar with this as a rich farmer, okay? And and Jesus tells the story, and basically the storyline is that he had really good dirt, okay? And this really good dirt produced a bumper crop. And all of a sudden, he's got a decision to make because he's got all this grain, he's got to figure out what to do. And, and his decision is, I know, I'm just going to build bigger barns. And what you find in this whole, this whole monologue that he's got going on here is he, me, 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 I, 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 my, myself. Listen to what he says. And then I'll sit back and I'll say to myself, my friend, you have stored away, enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night, and then who will get what you worked for? Yes, and this gets into that saying, yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not have a rich relationship with God. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Now, Jesus' main point here wasn't, you know, oh, you shouldn't build storage facilities or you shouldn't save for the future. That's not what he's saying. He's basically talking about greed, and that's what he warns people about right before the story. This is aimed at greed. Whatever comes to me belongs to me. Instead of understanding that, you know, God owns, we manage. He places it in our hands to do with it as he would, as he would do with it. And so that's obviously not what Jesus taught. You know, Jesus didn't teach greed. He basically said, you know, you've been given, and if you've been given a lot, he says, you're responsible for that. You're accountable for that. And if you've been given much more, then you're much more accountable for that. So this guy who died is not going to need this because dead people don't need anything. It's going to get passed on to somebody else. You know, remember we talked about the Pyramid of Giza and how Khufu, you know, built this monstrous, you know, uh, monument to his own success, 750 feet by 750 feet by, you know, 480 feet high, you know. And then the people, grave robbers came, and they took all the stuff and threw out his dead body. The only way we can make a difference is if we use what has been given to us to make a difference between, before we go. 
And here's the deal. God's point in calling us and what he asks us to do, and you need to be prepared for this, is he calls us to give more than we are comfortable giving up. Because you see, left to ourselves, we just give the leftovers. We'd, you know, make sure we pay for the food and the car and the house and everything else that's going on in our lives, you know. And we'd pay for all that stuff, and then we throw leftovers to God like he's the family dog, instead of understanding that he owns, we don't own, he owns and we manage. And he's called us to help others with what he has entrusted with us. Let's get back to the story, okay? Common thread through this story uh, of the Aramean army and you know, the, the Samaritans and everything like that is fear. People put walls around their cities because they're afraid. And maybe rightly so back then. You know, people would come in and take, marauders would come along and kill the people and take all the stuff. So, but the problem is that, that those walls had basically turned that city into a prison. <laughs> it wasn't people getting in, but food wasn't getting in either. So that's a problem. God, the Lord of Heaven's armies, comes into the Aramean camp and scares them to death. God uses fear to provide for the people in the city that they're sieging, okay? And then it's the fear of death that actually gets these four lepers to move on this and think, okay, well, we might as well go over and see if they'll do something for us. And they go over and they find the tent. And it's also the fear that causes them, you know, it says, woe be to us if we don't do something with this good news. This is good news, and we're holding it all for ourselves. Something bad is going to happen if we don't do something with it. So it's fear that motivates them to do something, fear of God that motivates them to do something. And fear really is kind of the big deal in our lives, isn't it? It's the fear of not having enough. And I'm telling you, it runs our lives, you know. It's what keeps us from giving. It's part of my life, and it's a part of your lives. And it includes people that you would never suspect. Jeff Bezos, why does he, you know, stockpile, you know, 240-some billion or whatever he has right now? Well, he, he wants to make sure that he keeps control of it. Because after all, he might need to invest at some place, you know. And then, of course, there's Elon Musk's life. And he's now, I think, at the top of the heap, you know. And fear motivates his life, too. And then, of course, there's, you know, uh, Taylor Swift. She's just reached the billionaire club, you know. So she, now she's on that list. And fear keeps her going and so on. And it keeps everybody moving in the direction they're moving without ever stopping to think, this is not mine. God gave it to me. I am simply the manager of what he has given. And if you let fear go wild in your life and it keeps you from giving, it will keep you from one of the most powerful things that you can do with your life. It freezes your assets is what it does. Now here's what I know, okay? Humans, we know how to give, okay? Most of us give to our children. Uh, some of us give at work, you know, to people, you know, give them one of our sandwiches or something. We give to our friends, you know, and so on. And if we see a few, see enough sad pictures, we'll probably throw a few shekels, you know, out to the ch charities and see sad dogs who are shivering and, shivering and stuff like this. So, you know, but what God wants isn't just that we give, because we do that. He wants to turn us into generous people. And generous people are people who make that part of their habitual way of life. And yet, the more people have, the less generous they are. That's a fact. So here's my question. My question is, and this will determine you know, who you become before you die, do you actually want to be a generous person and plan for that? Or you just want to be seen as a generous person. I mean, we all want to be seen as a generous person. Oh, he's a generous person. He'd give the, he'd give the shirt off of his back. But actually being a generous person is different. Let me kind of uh, introduce you to the cycle of crazy. So greed, if it comes to me, you know, it belongs to me. That's the whole story of the farmer. Here's, here's kind of the, what, it, what goes on in our world. And we say, well, I can't give. And it starts the crazy cycle. We start with worry, okay? We worry about, you know, having enough for the future. Am I going to have enough when I retire? Am I going to have enough for my kids to have braces? So we start worrying about that. So that kind of moves us to make. So we make, you know, money, and we also consume what we make. In fact, the truth of the matter is, in Canada, people tend to actually consume more than they make. They spend more than they make. Well, that creates a problem, that problem's called debt, okay? Uh, you rent the money to get the things that you consume. And when we are in debt, then that leaves no margin. And we begin to feel the pressure, and we think, I need to make more. 
But when we actually, you know, worry about that, then we think, why? Well, I, I want to make enough so that I don't have to, you know, keep coming back here. And it just keeps going. Honestly, I mean, <laughs> and this again, these are facts, you know. Uh, homes in the GTA typically are $1.1 million, okay. SUVs, you know, usually somewhere between 80,000, you know, they range, okay. But, you know, the average would be about 80,000. And we have cell phones and we have vacations and we have clothes and we pay for pets, obnoxious prices for pets. Some of us spend more on our pet food than we actually do, than we give away, and coffee and pizza. So we do the things that we really want to do. We pay for the things that we really want to, want to pay for. And when it gets down to give, it's not I can't give. I mean, Jesus blessed a woman who gave two little copper pennies because it was all she had to live on. We can give. We can, we can be generous people. The point is we don't want to use our money in that way. And so we make other plans for it. Now, the only way off this cycle here, the only way off ramp on this thing is generosity. And it's where you begin to plan to make a difference, you see. Generous people, you know, believe that what what they have has been entrusted to them, that it's God's blessing on their lives. It belongs to them. Generous people believe that we have all been called to be generous and we are held accountable for what we do with our money and our stuff. Generous people believe that we can ask God if we need bread, and he'll give us bread, because Jesus told us to pray for that. Jesus taught us to ask, and we'll receive, and seek, and we'll find, and knock, and doors will be open. Generous people believe that, you know, what we give, what we, you know, invest is an investment in eternity, and it makes a difference for, for all of eternity. Now, let's kind of take a look at what this actually looks like in our lives. What generous people do... First of all, giving is a priority. Like it's not like leftover, like I'll maybe decide to give and so on, you know, or give when I feel like it. It's a priority in their lives. Priority prior, is started with the word prior. It means prior to buying anything else, prior to spending my money in other ways, I am going to make sure that I give. And that's simply what, you know, the scriptures tell us to do. It says, you know, put God's kingdom first and everything else is going to be added to you. There's a percentage and this starts out right in the Old Testament, giving 10%, tithe, you know, that's what the word tithe means. And if we don't do this, and, it, and maybe, maybe it's not going to be 10%, but it will be a percentage, it will be a consistent percentage of what you give, and the other side will be sporadic. In other words, you'll just throw God leftovers whenever it happens to be convenient for you. And then the third thing is progressive. You know, we, we continue to grow in this area. It's kind of like exercise, like the only way, you know, to get your, you know, flabby giving muscles into shape is to basically exercise them, and it takes a progressive way of doing that. Jesus said, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So according to Jesus, what comes first? Well, the kingdom does, and his righteousness. This why question is where it gets really interesting. Why should I give? Why should I spend money on, you know, what God is up to instead of the things that I want? Why should I do that? And I want you to think for just a minute. What's the point of your life? So you've got, you know, 70, 80, 90 years here. What's the point of your life? Because if you're a follower of Jesus, you know that the next life, like eternity, is way, 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 way longer than this life. And if you're going to invest something there, and Jesus told us to, he called it storing up treasure in heaven, you're going to want to do that. But I'm telling you, it's not going to automatically happen. Like, you're not going to just drift into it one day when you're down shopping at Bay and Bloor. Apparently, it's possible to have a pile of stuff here and have nothing there. Paul talks about this, you know. He said, you know, the stuff that we do and the stuff that we give, he said, you can get to a point where, you know, when it comes down to the final judgment, the whole thing burns up. There's nothing left. You walk into heaven smelling like smoke. And you really have not that all that much to show for your life. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. Jesus talked about in one of his best-known messages about where your treasure is going. And that's what you and I need to figure out. He said, don't store up your treasures here on earth where moths, you know, eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. You know, store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. A wealthy young leader came up to Jesus one time, and he says, so I'd like to inherit eternal life. You know, what do I have to do? 
looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. Now, Jesus isn't telling everybody to go and sell everything they have, you know, and give it to the poor and follow him. He wants us to follow him. But I'm telling you, this doesn't also exempt us from that. It means we are called to give. We are called to help people who don't have what we have. Jesus said, yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. You know why? It's because all of our stuff gets scraped off of us when we leave, you know? Like, we're about, you know, we're, we're about ready to hit the grave, you know? And I'll tell you, we ain't taking nothing with us. And sometimes, you know, if we have a little, maybe God only has to use a little scraper like this, you know, just scrape it off of us because we can't take it with us. Or... Maybe we have a little bit more, you know, and he has to use a little bit bigger scraper to get it all off of us, you know, but nothing's going with us. And then, of course, for some, <laughs> there's a big scraper, you know, and there are bigger ones than this, you know, it's got to scrape it all off, leave it here. And that's the truth. That's the truth. You know, when you have to leave it all at your grave and you can't take anything with you, you're going to want to have sent some ahead. That's what you're going to want to do. That's what I want to do. I know that. Now, here's the principle I think that fits when it comes to storing up treasure in heaven. You and I invest in what we value, right? Like, if you don't care about your car, you don't invest a whole much in it. You just kind of a tool to get you from point A to point B. But if you really, really like your car, well, you invest the money in it, polishing it up and keeping it nice. You know, we invest in what is important to us. Remember the story about, you know, the, the seed that was planted in different kinds of soil? Jesus said it makes a difference what kind of soil it gets planted in, and he uses this analogy of seed a lot. He talks about the kingdom. He says it's like a tiny seed, and it gets planted, you know, out in a garden someplace, and the thing grows into this mammoth, in this case, mustard bush, or it could be, you know, pine tree or something like that, and it protects other animals. It does lots of good. We harvest what we plant. We harvest what we plant. And this is what it says. Paul writes this. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from what that sinful nature, uh, from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity Whenever we have the opportunity, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. What does Jesus value? Well, he's pretty clear about that right at the beginning of his mission, right? Said to Nicodemus, he says, God so loved this world that he gave his one and only son so that no one would perish, but everyone would have the opportunity to have everlasting life. Investing is like a farmer uh, planting seed. You know, so is it a smart farmer who grinds up all the seed into flour and, you know, makes extra bread for everybody? Not really, you know. <laughs> you got you to plant seed. Let me show you how this works, okay? Because Jesus made the statement, you know, that he was like a grain of wheat that was going to be going to the ground and so on. Let me just kind of show you the, um, how this works out when you begin to, when you begin to look at it when, uh, from the farmer's point of view. So... But this is by the numbers. This is where Jesus in John chapter 12, verse 24 says, you know, he said, a kernel of wheat that's planted into the ground, he says, you know, if you just set it on the shelf, nothing's going to happen. But if you plant it, then it grows a lot. So year one of planting a kernel of wheat, you get 80 kernels of wheat. Or if you eat it, you get zero. Year two, you get 6,400 kernels of wheat. Or if you eat it, you get zero. Year three, you get 512,000 kernels of wheat, or if you eat it, you get zero. Year four, you get 41 million kernels of wheat, or 41 bushels of wheat, but if you eat it, you get zero. Year five, you get 3,280 bushels of wheat from that one kernel of wheat that you started with, or you get zero if you eat it. Year six, 262,000 bushels of wheat if you plant it, or zero if you don't. Year seven, and this kind of keeps on going, 21 million bushels of wheat, four, 42, 420,000 tons of flour is what you get from it. And it just keeps on going. 
See, the way this works with us is, you know, getting money out beyond this final barrier. And this is the final barrier. This is where everything gets scraped off. The only way to get beyond that is to invest it in people. And then you get a chance to see what God's done with it. See, harvest isn't now. You know, you invest a kernel of wheat and it just looks like you buried it in the dirt, like it just died and, and went into a grave. But when you invest it in people, it goes out ahead of you into heaven. It's a powerful thing. We're afraid to do it, and that's exactly why Satan uses fear to keep us away from it. Because he knows that what's going on is it's going to destroy his kingdom, and it's going to do incredible good that we could never even begin to imagine. And I think you'd probably agree, you know, that fear keeps us from investing in the welfare and the lives and the futures of people who will live for everywhere. But it doesn't come from God. That kind of fear, he wants us to push beyond our fear, to walk toward our fear and do something that will last forever. And here's what I know. This isn't automatically going to happen. You're not going to be walking down the street someday and think to yourself, wow, you know, I'd really like to be a generous person. I'm going to start giving and giving and giving. Like, this isn't going to happen. It's going to be when God the Spirit begins to, begins to you know, thaw your heart and all your frozen assets and some of the water leaks out through your eyes and you begin to see the world as God sees it and you want to invest in it. Sometimes we just settle for good intentions. <laughs> good intentions, you know, count for nothing. Like absolutely nothing. God is not going to ask us when we step onto the other shore, you know. So, well, you really meant well. You really wanted to do this, you know. You just never did it. No, no, that, that doesn't count. Good intentions are nothing. These four lepers discovered more than they ever thought that they ever find. They became heroes. And they invested it in the people that they knew and loved in the city that was just nearby. They said this, this is not right. This is a day of good news, and we aren't sharing it with anyone. If we wait until morning, some calamity will certainly fall upon us. So let me ask you the question. What are you waiting for? What are we waiting for? See, when that thought crosses our minds and we refuse it and we push it away, then everything freezes up again and the whole thawing process has to start all over again. See, the deal is, you know, you can, you know, with wheat, you can eat all of it yourself. You can stuff your house full of it, you know, and, and never plant anything, but then you have nothing if you don't plant it. When God works in our hearts, when he melts our hearts, he's basically saying, I want to do something through your life. I want to change other people's lives. And it comes through this stupid thing called money that you go out every day and you earn it, but you can do something with it that will last forever. And as you know, it takes time. You want to start planting. Like if you've got some weed in your hand, you know, like this, you're going to want to start planting it because it takes time for this to multiply, but I'm telling you, it does multiply, and it is just amazing. You think about that, okay? Just a few weeks ago, we baptized seven people. So, seven people, but you think about who all those people are gonna touch throughout their lifetime, and then how that they will make a difference, and how that then the people that they touch will make a difference, and how the people that they touch will make a difference, and I'll tell you, it just, it's exponential. It just keeps on growing, but that's what you have to see. That's what you have to understand if you're going to give. Jesus tells us, you know, there's a harvest. You can't consume everything that you, have, that you eat or that you make or brings into your house, you know, because there's a harvest for that too. There's a harvest for consuming everything, and you're not going to like it. You want to invest in what counts and what lasts for eternity. You're going to want to be intentional about this because it means you're going to have to have a plan. It's a priority. You make it a priority you give a percentage of what you have, and it's progressive. You continue to grow from there. And that's where we need to be. That's what I believe God is calling us to do. And now it's decision time. You've got to decide what you're going to do. Are you going to keep it all for yourself and keep telling yourself, I can't afford to give, I can't afford to do anything like this, you know, but someday in the future, someday when I have a lot of money, someday when I win the lotto, you know, something, some, something big's going to happen, and then I'll do it. Well, it won't happen. We have to start now. Let's walk towards it. Fear is what keeps us back. And maybe you want to just pray and say, God, instead of making me the center of my life, I want you to be the center of my life. 
and I want to use what you've entrusted to me as you would use it. Why don't you do that? Why don't you do that? Let's make it today. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for all that you've given us. Thank you for allowing us to live in a part of the world where we don't usually have to worry about a meal and we don't have to worry about putting gas in our car. We don't have to worry about whether we're going to be warm or not. Thank you for all the gifts that you give. Now help us to pass those on to the other people in the world who need them. Help us, oh God, to just be generous and become generous people with what you've given and to build treasure in heaven. Amen. God bless you as you go, and may he give you the heart to do with what you've been given as he would want you to do. Amen. What a good reminder that in order to be generous with our finances, that we need to be intentional, and we need to remember who it all belongs to. We can be good stewards of what we've been given, and we can make it a priority to give our first back to God. As a church, when we began 20 years ago, we decided that we wanted to do things differently and really invest in our community. In order to make that happen and for it not to just be a dream, we decided that a percentage of the ties would go back in meeting the needs around us. Let's take a look at this video as Ken Davis and John Deacon share with us how it all began. So this is John Deacon, and I know John. I've known John since forever. Um, first time I remember hearing about John was he was the only person in the church who had a small group with the homeless people in downtown Toronto. John was uh, one of the key persons who walked through me walked with me through probably the most horrible experience of my life and with our family. And, uh, and he was one of the founding members of the Olive Branch. He helped us renovate this building, dropped his cell phone in a can of paint upstairs. <laughs> but the one thing that John did was he made it clear that uh, if we were truly going to be a church that pleased Jesus, then it needed to include Jesus' last message. I was without a place to stay, and you gave me a place to stay. I, I uh, didn't have anything to eat, you gave me something to eat. I didn't have anything to drink and you gave me something to drink. I was sick and in prison and you came and visited me. That that had to be a part, not mm -hmm. just of the scriptures that we read, but it had to be part of the life of this church. Mm -hmm. So, John, you started Branch Out and uh, and you were very clear about this and it, and it rang through all of those first meetings that we had as we began to dream about what God might want to do. Yeah. So. Branch Out started as a twofold thing, as a benevolent fund whereby we were collecting money, 10% of every offering would go to assisting the community at large, not just members of the church, but the community at large. But also it would be a commitment the church was making that we were not going to be a church within ourselves. We were going to be a church without walls, yeah. I think was the term was we used, exactly right. yeah. which meant we were saying to the members of the congregation, you're in church. Monday to Friday, you're in church. Yeah. It just happens to be your workplace. It happens to be yeah. the social agency you're connected to. It happens to be your volunteer work. But we want you to understand that your Christianity is to embrace your connection to the community. And so that was the whole heart of Branch Out. And from that vantage point, it branched out into many things that I don't think you or I ever anticipated. Oh. It caught fire. Like, I don't think there was ever any need to convince people that we needed to do this. This latched into our heart. This was going to be a new kind of church. And, and we were not going to be drag kicking and screaming into helping people. Like, this was going to be a part of our identity of who we were. And, and I don't, I, there was enthusiasm about it. And it, it did create some pain. Like I remember when the whole crash happened at uh, 2008 and 2009, and the treasurer came to the board and said, I think we had to cut branch out from 10% really? down to 5%. Oh, and the unanimous thing was, I mean, we, we didn't blow it out of the water, but the unanimous sense was, no, we're not gonna do that. Because wow. it's an act of faith. What we're doing is an act of faith, just like anybody who's tithing. Yeah. And, uh, and the commitment was, we're gonna stay with it. Our, call, our belief was that God would have to speak to people, and that was our prayer. God, you could have to speak to people to move beyond just throwing leftovers at you, uh, to give so that we can actually 
fulfill our commitments to people in need. Branch Out is not to be a new program. It's to, be, it's to basically provide the resource for people who are already out there engaged and just say, what do you need from us that we can help you in what you're doing? We went, I remember we went to the York, um, York Center for Abused Children or something like that. I think it's changed its name since. But we said to them, you are doing great work and probably we know kids that are accessing your services. As a caring community, what can we do to help you in the work that you're doing in the community? You know what they said? They said, could you give us $1,500 and we could take a staff retreat? Yeah. Because our staff is burnt out. So that's all we did. Yeah. But the connection we got every year, we would, we would figure out how we could help them thereafter. I think that's where we're at. And I know that the church has continued that legacy by helping refugees and immigrants and yeah. Uh, food banks and all that kind of stuff, but it, for me, it is the conviction that the church, unless it's meaningfully gained, engaged in the world, and not the world, the affluent world, but the world of human need, boy, that's when Christ really stands out. It changes the people who give. It changes the people who receive, and it also changes the people who give and engage. And there's a whole reward on the other side that we just we don't see right now. It's it's what we've planted that uh, that is growing and making a difference and it goes way beyond anything that we could ever even yeah. begin to understand. What we do as a church engages us all and so I think it's really important for people to feel good about and be able to say church I'm a part of man we're involved all over the place we are helping people we are doing what we, we believe that Christ calls us to do and that's what people expect People expect that if you're a church, you gotta be doing something for people. And I think that everybody would be able to say with confidence, we're engaged. We're not perfect. Uh, we're not doing as much as we can and hope to someday, but we're engaged in the need in our, in our world. Our heart is reflected by what we invest in. Yeah. And if a church claims to have a heart, it should be reflected in what it invests in. And if it doesn't invest in at least 10% in engaging in the community around it to the same degree Jesus did, then you really have to say, are we really all that we could be in terms of living out our faith? We are invested not just in ourselves. We are not interested in becoming a group of 50,000 at the expense of not mattering to the people who live closest to us. We want to be community. And the way that we're going to demonstrate that community is not just by volunteering for whatever it is that you would have us volunteering, but we're going to invest in you. And right now that, that number is 10%. It has been a result of all of us coming together over the past 20 years that we've been able to invest what we have into the people in this church, in our community partners and the work that they do, and also into the individual needs of those in our community. During our first week of Good News Give Back, the call to action was to love others generously. You can still go to the Good News Give Back page and learn about our community partners who are loving others well. As well, daily, we can just choose to 
love others generously. Last week, the call to action was to serve generously. You can still go to the Good News Give Back page and sign up for those one-time service opportunities. You can learn more about Partners in Care Ministry and fill out a volunteer interest form. You can learn about our community partners who are serving others well. There are just so many options for you to practice serving others. This week, our call to action is to give generously. We have put together a card to help you reflect on where you're at on your generosity journey and how you could make giving a priority in your life and working up to giving a percentage of your income the way that Jesus really desires and God wants us to in our life. And all of this is to help us to progress uh, with our generosity in order to invest in God's kingdom. I would also encourage you, if you have kids or teens in your house, include them in these conversations. What a great time in their lives to begin to learn about what it means to be generous and to make sure their firsts are going to God as well. Also, if some of the decisions that you make in terms of progressing in your giving require some cutbacks, they might have some great ideas of how to do that. And what a great way for them to understand why you might choose not to do something uh, in order to give more to God's mission and his kingdom work. Thank you so much for being part of Good News Give Back the past few weeks. Jesus is on a mission, and he is calling us to join him. And we get to do that by loving, serving, and giving generously. But let's just not make this a, a one-time event thing, but something that we do in our daily lives throughout the year. We hope you have a fantastic week.